want you to say a word five times really quickly and then I'm going to ask you a question and then you've got to answer that question as quickly as possible. You'll get it as we go along. All right. So I want you to say silk five times really quickly all together as a group. All right. So silk, 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 silk. What do cows drink? Milk. Are you sure cows drink milk? I thought cows drink water. All right. Another one. Another one. I want you to, same kind of deal, same kind of deal. Um, I want you to say shop five times. Shop, 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 shop. What do you do at a green light? Stop. Oh, there's a few people that were saying stop. Some of you like said stop so certain, like no, you don't, really don't say, you, you go at a green light, all right. But you, you can be so certain of something and then it ends up being wrong. But we live in a world of uncertainty. Um, you know, will I have a job next week? Um, will I get into uni? Um, will TAFE accept me? Um, will I get a spouse? Will I be able to afford a house? Um, we live in a world of uncertainty. And, um, you know, school's one of those places uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty. But for me, when I was at high school, there was one thing that was certain. You know, I didn't mind school. Um, lunch was pretty all right. Um, recess was good, home time was ideal, um, sport was pretty alright as well, but it was English and it was geography. I'm sorry if there's any English or geography teachers out there, no in offence intended, um, but I really didn't get into those subjects at all and I could just make it over. When's this going to end? But there was one thing that I had certainty in, that at 11.05, or 11.36, or whatever day it was, there was going to be a bell. The sweet, sweet sound of a bell marking that English is over. That bell gave me hope. And that was, that was good news for me, that bell. But this word hope, you know, we kind of throw around a lot. Um, you know, I, I hope the weather's good tomorrow. I hope it's not too hot. I hope you go well in your exam. Um, I hope you go well at the job interview, all that kind of stuff. It's like wishful thinking. It's like the glass half full kind of response. But that's not the hope that the Bible talks about. The, the Bible talks about hope that is firm and secure. Let's have a look at the verse that Josie read out to us. Verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So the hope that we have, the hope that we're talking about tonight is firm and secure. It is safe and sound. It is guaranteed. That's the hope that we're talking about today. That's the hope that Cleo was sharing. And this passage gives us three reasons to have hope. The first is an unbelievable promise. The second is that God can't lie. And the third thing is that Jesus is the source of our hope. We can have certain hope because Jesus. So the first an unbelievable promise. Verse 14. I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now it's not, not kind of a really big deal. You know, couples have kids all the time. But a bit of backstory for those of you who don't know the Abraham story. Abraham was 75 years old when this promise came. I don't know about you, but don't see too many 75-year-olds having kids. Grandkids for sure but not kids. And his wife is 65 years old. So not a whole lot of 65-year-old women having children. And besides that, she'd been trying to have children her whole life, but had been childless. So, you know, hashtag this isn't going to happen. Hashtag impossibility and doubt. This is not going to happen. And it's almost a bit laughable, like this old guy and an old lady having kids. It's not going to happen. But this is what Romans 4 says about Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Without weakening in his faith, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Twenty five years later, 25 years after God made that promise as a 75-year-old, Abraham is now 100 and he gives birth to Isaac. 25 years later, God isn't in a rush in keeping his promises. We kind of like things really snappy, you know, but we think we're patient, right? We think that, you know, the um, five seconds, you know, we, we think that we're patient because we can wait five seconds to hit the skip ad button on YouTube. I think, oh, I'm patient. I can wait the five seconds. But it kills us when that banner at the top says, 
like your video will play after this 30 second advertisement. You wanna scream, you wanna rip the monitor down, you don't wanna wait 30 seconds, you want it now. That's who we are. How are we gonna wait 25 years? But yet, Abraham, and he got a lot of things wrong, don't get, don't get me wrong, but he is an example to us of waiting patiently for God. In, in, in possible situations, Abraham wasn't, wasn't daydreaming. He didn't have like a camel catalog open, like looking at the latest models of camels because he needed to upgrade his camel to get a bigger one for his big family that was gonna happen. He wasn't daydreaming, he wasn't wishful thinking. God made him a promise. God made him a promise and so Abraham expected. So he waited, he waited 25 years. The certainty that Abraham had in Jesus, in God answering that promise, meant that he waited, meant that he waited. And um, just as a little bit of a side point, if you're in Jesus tonight, you are a fulfillment to that promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago. If you are a child of Jesus, you're also a child of Abraham. Galatians 3, 7, 7 says this. It says, understand then that those who believe our children of Abraham. So if you love Jesus, you're a fulfillment of that promise that God made to Abraham 4,000 years ago. He's still fulfilling that promise. That is fantastic. But not only did God make a promise, he also made an oath. He wanted to prove that he can't lie. Verse 17. God, oh, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Um, God doesn't want us to just know him as a promise maker, but a promise keeper. So he made an oath. Now, oaths for us aren't really a big deal. Um, you know, like if you ever go to a court or you watch a court movie, like probably most of you, you know, like they get you to put your left hand in your Bible, raise your right hand and you say, you probably say it with me, I swear to hold, tell the whole truth. No, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God, you're, you're making an oath. Or when you are sick and you go to the doctor and you get the doctor to write out a little note or if you're at school, you get your mom to write you a note or your dad to write you a note. You are in a sense making an oath saying, I really was sick. I swear it on my mum's note that I was sick. That's the kind of oaths that we get here. But in Bible times, oaths were really serious. There's an Old Testament story of a guy who made a ridiculous oath. He promised to kill the first thing that was going to come out of his house when he got home. The first thing that came out of his house was his daughter. And because he would rather have his reputation intact, he killed his daughter. If he didn't kill his daughter, his reputation would have been ripped to shreds. Oaths are a big deal. And so God is making an oath. God is making an oath. And there's, there's nothing greater for God to make an oath to. So he made it to himself. Verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. You know, the whole kind of thing, the doctor's note, the, the medical certificate, all that kind of stuff is all appealing to a higher authority. But God is the ultimate authority. God is the ultimate authority. He has no one to appeal to. And so he appeals to his reputation as God. He doesn't want us just to know him as a promise maker, but a promise keeper. Verse 18. God did this. This whole rigmarole, this mucking of promise and oath, promise and oath, promise and oath. He did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Just, just let that settle in. It's impossible for God to lie. You and I lie, but it's impossible for God. That promise that he made to Abraham, it wasn't a lie. That oath that he took, he couldn't lie. But we often make tell lies. Like we're going to have a little bit of a clip. Watch a clip. Can you play that for us, Josh? You are coming, right? Um, of course, of course. Pinky promise. <sighs> oh, yes. My pinky promises. <gasps> it's all bloody! That promise seemed legit, yeah? Very legit. Yeah, I have my pinky promises. And if you've seen the movie, you know that Gru goes on to go and steal the moon that day that their recital's on. So he's not very good at keeping his promise. The same as us. We lie. We exaggerate. We, we RSVP on Facebook and then not show up. Um, we exaggerate. You know, perhaps we don't do this maliciously, um, but it's just part of who we are. 
Uh, we, we, we both make promises and promises are broken. We, we let down others and we ourselves are let down. Maybe it was a parent or a spouse. Uh, maybe a teacher made a promise to you. Um, but that, that sucky feeling of being let down, of being lied to, of a broken promise will never, ever happen with God. His, his word stands. He is faithful to his word. Everything in this Bible is, is true. Everything that God says is true. He says what he does and he does what he says. And if you're someone who's not accustomed or doesn't regularly open up the Bible, let me encourage you to do that and let the God of truth speak to you. One of the songs that we sing here at MBM, uh, written by our very own Scott Lavender, it's not a paid commercial, um, is Cleansing Hearts. And I love the words um, of, of the bridge part towards the end. It says, and I think the words will be up on the screen, um, oh, you never, are they up there, Josh? Yes. Oh, you'll never in a million years change your plans and fill our minds with fear. You're the God who keeps his word and his promise strong and sure till we come home. God can't lie. He makes an oath and he keeps his oath because he can't lie. He speaks the truth. And that is why we have hope. Because when God says something, it's going to come true. When God does something, it is sure. And that brings a certain amount of comfort. And that's the very reason he did this. Verse 18, if we read the rest of it, it says the exact reason why God promises and owes, promises and owes, promises and owes, because he wants you to know that he is for you. Let's read verse 18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. May be greatly encouraged. The, the God who created you, the God who made the universe, made you a promise, made you an oath, and he can't lie. So that you would be greatly encouraged. So you don't, you don't have to freak out. You don't have to worry because God is in control. He makes promises and he keeps promises. And if that's not enough, 2 Corinthians 1 says this. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Jesus or in Christ. Every promise that has been made to you, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, death being squashed, peace with God will all have the answer, yes, in Jesus. That's the hope that we have. That's the hope that we have, all coming through Jesus. Hebrews, oh, no, verse, verse 19 of the, the reading. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. Let's just kind of think about that picture um, an anchor. Now, if you've been hanging out in a boat um, and there's waves and current and all that kind of stuff, you, you, you drop an anchor over the side, that anchor grabs onto the bottom of the, the river or the ocean or whatever it is and holds you secure. It's, it's firm and secure. Um, but the anchor that this passage is talking about isn't in the water. Look where it is. It is in the inner sanctuary. It is behind the curtain. It's where Jesus is. It's, it's where, where Jesus entered the, the throne room of God, where, where God's throne is, where he offered up his life as a sacrifice for our sins. That is where our anchor is. Right at the right hand of God, Jesus is sitting. The anchor, which is our hope, is anchored right in there in God's throne room. That is incredible. And look where the anchor is attached to. It is attached to what? Our soul. We have an, uh, our hope as an anchor for the soul. It's not attached to our arm and can pull it off. It's attached to our soul, our very person, our very being. So if you're in Jesus tonight, if you're in Jesus, you are here, but you're, you have an anchor. I don't know, the kind of freaky word picture, but you have an anchor running out from your soul out into God's throne room. A place that's permanent, a place that doesn't rust, a place that doesn't wear out, that is where your, your hope is. Your hope's not going anywhere because God has made a promise and God can't lie. And, and, and so 
when he says that your hope is firm and secure, it is firm and secure because God can't lie. You'll you get the hang of by the third one, I'm sure. So he isn't going to change his mind because he... All right, we got a third time around. Great job, guys. God can't lie. And so that's where your certain hope is because he can't lie. Maybe you're someone here tonight who is, is checking out Jesus. Maybe you've come along um, supporting one of the teenagers. Great that you're here. But I mean, really, this applies to all of us. Um, if you're trusting in anything here on earth, whether it's wealth or work, whether it's marriage or your money, you know, as good as they might be, they're not going to last. They'll, they'll wear out. They're, they're temporary. They'll, they'll, they'll run out. Um, your possessions, the likes and subscriptions and friends you've got on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, your relationship status, the influence that you might have in a company or in your school, it's going to fade. Any, putting your hope in there is going to let you down. The only place where hope is not going to let you down is placing it in Jesus because the anchor isn't here. Your hope is placed in heaven, a place that won't be destroyed. And so how do we respond how do we today, realising that our hope isn't located here, that our hope is located in a permanent place of heaven? Well, we hold on to that anchor, right? It'd be a bit silly to chuck an anchor over the side of a boat and then cut it off. No, you hang on to that anchor. You hang on to Jesus. When it's uncool to follow Jesus, when you get knocked back for a promotion because you're a Christian, when you're going through a, a messy relationship, you hold on to Jesus. Because that's where your hope is. Not in the relationship, not in the job, not in whatever. It is anchored in heaven. But you don't just hold on and, and bear with it and get through it. There's also encouragement. Remember that all of this thing was about so that we might be greatly encouraged. The promise, the oath was so that not just we'd hold on, but so we'd be encouraged while we're holding on. Because we have a God who doesn't lie. You know, we don't get encouraged because we're getting bullied. We get encouraged because we have a God who can't lie. We, we don't get encouraged because you lose your job or you get diagnosed with cancer. We have courage because you have a God who doesn't lie, a God who keeps his promises, a God who has anchored our hope in heaven, not here on earth. A place where your hope can't be stolen, it can't be um, taken away, it can't be lost, it can't be broken. It is secure in heaven. And that is fantastic news. But my question that I'll leave you with and we'll pray is where is your hope? Is it in something here? Or is it anchored in heaven with Jesus? Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for the, the firm and secure hope that we have in your son, Jesus. We, we love the fact that you're a promise maker. We love the fact that even more that you're a promise keeper because you can't lie. And we love that all of your promises are yes in Jesus. In the uncertain times that we live in, help us to, to cling to the hope not to let go. Help us to, to wait patiently for your promises to be fulfilled, knowing that it will be over, that we will get to be in heaven one day. Help us to be encouraged, not at the situations, but encouraged that you are a God who keeps his promises. And we are so thankful for the name of Jesus. And all God's people shouted, Amen.